Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's nice to have more people in today as well. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing this session with you. Uh, first of all, I just want to do a few bits of housekeeping before we start. Uh, make sure that uh, everyone knows they can ask questions. You can ask questions by typing questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And you can introduce yourself, say hello in chat. I know Vanessa, our speaker, uh, loves to hear about who you are and your business, et cetera, and what you'd like to get out of the uh, program today. So you're, she's going to do that in a little bit and ask you to put some of that information into chat. In the meantime, my name is Linda Griffian. I'm the Education Programs Coordinator with Business Link, and thanks for joining us today. At Business Link, we provide services to all entrepreneurs and specialty services to our immigrant and Indigenous entrepreneurs. We are inclusive in our cultural understanding and awareness of the histories of our country. With that, we'll start this event with a land acknowledgement to recognize all of Alberta. We want to acknowledge that in the province of Alberta, we are situated on the traditional territories of Treaties 4, 6, 7, 8, and 10, ancestral homeland of diverse First Nations group, Métis, and Indigenous people whose ancestors have walked this land since time immemorial and whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. We pay respects to the Indigenous people of this land, past, present, and future, while recognizing their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land on which we reside. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today. Vanessa Brown is going to be presenting Why Healthy Balance Sheets Matter. I'm looking forward to this one because I need a healthy balance sheet. Uh, you can ask your questions in Q&A. I'm going to place a link to all of the handouts, including a PDF of this slideshow, into the chat box. And I'm also going to make sure that uh, our marketing team who's uh, listening in today, they're going to post this webinar for us within the next two business days as a recording on the Business Link website as well. So without further ado, welcome, Vanessa. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Vanessa Brown. I am a CPA. Um, and a little bit about me. I have been working in accounting since 1995. I have two prior accounting designations before the merger of our uh, three bodies in Canada. I was a certified management accountant starting 2003 and then um, obtained the chartered accountant designation in 2007. I also taught in the CGA program, the Certified General Accountants Program, um, for five years at SAIT um, through 2010 let me think on that. It was 2005 to 2010. Um, I completed the three-year in-depth tax course in 2016, and I own and operate, I've owned and operated an accounting practice since 2009. Um, I currently work with small business owners, and I have two different businesses. One is a uh, professional practice where I would do your traditional uh, financial statements and tax returns at the end of the year. Um, and the other one is a fractional controllership or CFO services uh, firm. I call it the Small Enterprise CFO. Um, we have about an hour together, about 55 minutes from now, um, to go through this presentation. I think there's plenty of time, so I, I welcome your questions uh, throughout. And in the chat, just to give me a sense of um, uh, what kinds of examples would be helpful for all of you, if you could give me five pieces of information, um, your role in the business that you are here representing, what industry that is, so is it landscaping, consulting services, um, uh, you know, maybe what kind of consulting services, the stage or size of the business, is it startup, third year, um, you know, do you have 10 employees, do you have 100 employees, um, does your business have any debt or lease obligations? And maybe another one that you could put in there is if you have any investors in your business where you are obliged to um, pay dividends. And then uh, maybe what you hope to uh, get from this session. Um, and just a word to the wise, you can put dashes in between these things um, in the chat box. And if you are wanting to put multiple lines, just hold down the, I believe it's the shift key or the alt key while you hit enter and then it doesn't post the answer right away. Um, 
Okay, uh, I'm just going to wait for a few of those answers to come in so that I kind of can um, give some uh, good examples as we go. Um, I, I'll say this while I while I'm seeing all the answers come in. Uh, balance sheets are often one of the uh, most overlooked um, statements by business owners, particularly in the practices I've run. A lot of business owners focus only on the income statement and don't really realize uh, the importance and significance of the balance sheet. And and yet the balance sheet um, is critical to making sure that the income statement is correct. If the num if a number is wrong on the balance sheet, um, how it would normally get fixed is going through the income statement. So um, I um, when we talk about um, questions that a lot of people have about balance sheets. Is, you know, what does it mean to have a healthy balance sheet? Uh, how do others, such as the bank or my investors, how do they look at uh, the balance sheet? Um, how do I know that my balance sheet is healthy? What measures of the balance sheet uh, indicate health? What does an investor look at? What does a bank look like at? And how can I cure an unhealthy balance sheet? So how, what kinds of things do I need to do to make that balance sheet um, work or be better in the, in the next year. So there are different things that we would look at on a balance sheet. So uh, we wanna determine whether there's, there's adequate solvency and liquidity. And for those that need a definition on that, solvency means the ability to pay your debts off. And that's all of your debts. Um, liquidity is the ability to pay the ongoing obligations of the, the business. So what's your operating cash flow? Do you have enough to make payroll next week? Um, is there enough to pay all of the fixed charges, the, you know, loan payments, leasing payments, that kind of thing? Uh, we want to take a look and see whether we've got appropriate bor borrowing and adequate capital. So those are two different things. Borrowing is in the liability section and capital is in the owner's equity section. And owner's equity, uh, as a reminder, consists of the retained earnings of the business. So earnings that have been retained over time since the business began. And also any share capital, the, the amount that people have paid for their um, sh share capital. And another thing uh, that's often overlooked uh, in small businesses is this positive trends and forecasts. So what does the last five years look like? Let's do a graph. Um, and these days with so many of the software applications, this graphical analysis is uh, um, easier and easier to implement. And a lot of accounting packages uh, do prepare that. It's also important to make sure that the categorizations that you've used within the accounting system actually give the right information in those trends. Um, but um, we, we want to take, we do want to graph those things. And thanks everybody for putting in um, all the different information about your businesses. I see we have quite a variety of people uh, or a variety of businesses and um, uh, length of time in business. Although most of you seem to be under five years or five years and under. So why is a healthy uh, balance sheet important? There are three main users of the balance sheet. First is the business owner and shareholders. Shareholders usually are the business owner. Um, however, you may have a silent shareholder that's provided capital, uh, maybe in the form of preferred shares where they have a required um, uh, dividend payment every year. The, those, those would just be classified as a shareholder as opposed to a business owner. Anyone who owns common shares, they have a voting interest. So that means that they are the business owner and have a say in the business. Um, the other main category are investors and lenders. So these are uh, in, in a, um, lenders like the bank or other uh, mezzanine financing options. Um, and investors, uh, which it might be um, people who have 
as I said, uh, invested maybe in preferred shares, given you know hundred thousand dollars as share capital, and said pay me a six percent dividend every year, which is a lot like debt, but um, it, they're equity holders, and so it, it should they, they don't have a mortgage right or first right to the assets. Um, you might also have some potential partners. So I, often in my business, we run across situations where a business owner is either going to bring in another partner to their business, maybe it's an employee, or maybe it is um, some third party person. And they wanna, or maybe they're selling the business and they that balance sheet needs to be given uh, to those potential partners as information on whether or not they want to invest in the business, or maybe there's some things that need to be cleaned up. Sometimes we see situations where there's a very large shareholder loan. Um, so the business owes the shareholder, you know, 200 or $300,000. And um, that potential partner would uh, want to see that be cleared up before they invest in the business. Otherwise, their money could be just simply brought into the business in order to pay that shareholder out. Um, so when we have a healthy balance sheet, uh, we it increases the confidence in the business and therefore investors, lenders, potential partners or potential purchasers of the business would have much more confidence in, in the business and, and be more likely to advance funds. So let's take a look at some of the um, different measures of solvency and liquidity. Um, the first one is the quick ratio. Um, now, we in this description, it mentions the current ratio, and I'm just going to verbally say what the current ratio is. Current ratio is simply current assets divided by current liabilities. And it, it that current ratio is a measure of whether we have enough current assets to resolve our current liabilities, meaning that you know tomorrow could we pay out all our liabilities. Um, the quick ratio is even more important because, or even more, mm, it's a measure of our, our tomorrow payments, uh, a better measure of tomorrow payments. Because inventory, we may have three months of inventory on hand. Um, that means that we won't sell it all tomorrow and we won't have the, the money for that tomorrow. So we want to remove the inventory from the current assets and then divide by current liabilities. Um, it, and uh, the only places that I see that inventory are really liquid are restaurants, um, corner stores, grocery stores. Um, and so that's why we would remove the inventory. It's just not a liquid asset. When we have a ratio that is less than one, there is a liquidity problem. That means that our current assets, which would be cash assets and accounts receivable, most of the time, that's mostly the only things that are in there. So cash and accounts receivable are less than our uh, current operating line of credit and accounts payable, and maybe some payroll liabilities. So uh, um, what I find by bankers is that they want more than one. They would like to see that more like 1.2 or 1.5. Um, and when you are mortgaging, I am, uh, when you're mortgaging or going into some lending arrangements, the agreement will state any ratios that the bank considers important. So the example that we have here is that we have 150,000 in current assets, including inventory, and we minus out the 40,000 of inventory and divide that by the 100,000 of current liabilities. So we have 110 in, in uh, quick assets divided by 100,000 in current liabilities. So we have a 1.1 quick ratio. So we have more than enough to pay our liabilities tomorrow if we needed to. And that's a healthy place to be. Okay, so um, another ratio we like to see is what is our interest coverage? So interest coverage means how much, uh, it, it, um, do you have enough operating profit to pay interest? And, and 
other things. And that's why, um, okay. So the interest coverage is operating profit divided by interest payments. So this is the interest only portion of payments. If you have a mortgage, uh, we want to remove the principal portion out of those payments and have only the interest portion. So operating profit divided by interest payments, we want this to be two or more for most lenders. And this makes sense because if the business has only enough to pay interest, it doesn't have enough cash flow to pay the principal on the mortgage because the you need some operating profit um, above and beyond the interest to then pay some tax on that operating profit and then pay the principal portion. So two or higher, I often see three or four. And you, the, in the example that we see here is um, we have 9,167 of operating profit. And we divide that by the $750 of interest payments for that same period of time. And we have a 12.2 interest coverage ratio. It's important to know whether the operating profit is annual or monthly. And then same with the interest. We always want the same time period uh, that we're looking at. Um, I often see these in monthly um, categorizations, not just annual. Okay, so now we want to talk a little bit about the appropriate borrowing. So there are multiple ways to borrow. You can borrow from the bank. You can lease assets. You might be leasing um, a commercial space. And so this fixed payment coverage uh, is a really important ratio to look at, especially if you do have any leases at all. We take the operating profit and add back the asset lease payments. So just to be clear, when we are talking about operating profit in a business, we have revenue minus a bunch of expenses. Included in those expenses will be some lease payments, some operating leases, either on equipment or on your commercial space. So we take the operating profit um, before tax and add back the asset lease payments and then divide that by interest and principal and the asset lease payments. And the question that this ratio helps answer for us is can our profits cover all of our lease payments plus our interest and principal on our loans? And most lenders want two or better on this as well because you need to um, also pay um, back investors for their investment, or you might just need, well, every business needs to have profit that they would reinvest into the business to acquire new assets, acquire um, better technology and those types of things. So the example that we have here is uh, that we would, we take the 7,167 of operating profit and we add back all of our lease payments and um, divide that by our loan payment. And that is the interest plus principal. So that would be the total loan payment plus the lease payments. And in this case, we come up with a 2.6 coverage ratio. I'm sorry, the example actually doesn't have the dollar values for the lease payments. So we'll just, just, we'll just make a couple of assumptions on that. Um, Okay, so now another question that we have is, um, do we have enough capital? So capital, just to refresh our memories on what capital is, is the shareholder's equity or owner's equity. And that includes the amount that was originally paid to acquire the shares of the company, plus all of the retained earnings of the business. And so that's earnings that have been retained in the business over all of the years that the business has operated. Um, you know, why do we get retained earnings? Well, it's because the company invests money into assets. And so we would, if we've got a really large retained earnings, we often see a large um, capital asset balance on the 
uh, balance sheet as well. Sometimes we see a large inventory, um, which means that the company has lots of inventory to sell and we just need to go out and sell it to get some money in the door. Okay, so this debt to equity ratio tells us whether or not we have adequate capital in the company. We, we determine the amount, this ratio by taking total liabilities so this is total uh, current and long-term liabilities of the company and divide it by owner's equity. This measures how leveraged the business is and um, capital intensive businesses might have higher ratios because they've used a lot of borrowing to, um, to acquire the assets and that the bank has allowed that borrowing to happen because they've put liens directly on that property. Okay. Um, lenders usually want to have low numbers, two or lower. So we don't want to have liabilities that exceed the owner's equity uh, by more than twice the value of owner's equity. Again, you always just want to check with your lender. Different industries have different uh, criteria. Also, different phases of business will have different criteria. If you're a startup, sometimes there's a lot more forgiveness and that you can have higher um, debt ratios. Just because they know that they're supporting a small business and they believe in your plan. So another measure of having adequate capital is to look at the working capital ratio. So working capital is a measure of the liquid assets available for operation of the business. We would take current assets minus the current liabilities and that determines our working capital. Current assets will include your cash, your inventory and your accounts receivable. And I'm just going to review what a current asset is. It's an asset that um, is quite liquid and that would turn over usually in three or four months or less. It might it in when you come to a year end balance sheet, current assets is anything that will be turned into cash within twelve months. Um, so this, Again, inventory, how liquid inventory is depends on the industry that you're operating in. Current liabilities would generally be accounts payable, um, might be your line of credit if you've got a balance there um, that's, or, or a demand loan, um, something that the bank could demand within the next uh, year for sure, okay? or, or, or year or shorter actually. <clears throat> okay. So now another thing that we can look at is a trend analysis on um on our balance sheets. Okay. So and, and this can be a trend analysis on the revenue side, it could be a trend analysis on your balance sheet. What we're doing is we are comparing the balance in one period to the balance in another period. So a growth rate would be your ending value minus the beginning value divided by the beginning value. And this would help us identify any trends that are occurring. Um, you know, if we were looking at, say, revenue, this is often what business owners would, you know, um, take a look at as my growth in, in revenue. You can see absolute dollar growth. So last year I had 1.1 million in sales and this year I have 1.2 million. So I've had a growth of 100,000. But if we want that to express that as a percentage, we would take that $100,000 growth, divide it by the 1.1 million that we started with last year and end up with about a 9% growth rate in revenue, okay? We also look at those in on the balance sheet as well. We would take a look and see if there's a growth rate in the um, loan balance. Um, take and see if there's a growth rate in the asset balance or the current assets. 
and then we can spot some trends. So maybe we have growing revenue, but then we're also having growing debt at the same time. And that's because we're financing a bunch of you know, capital additions to enable and support that rev growth and revenue, or maybe we had to hire a bunch more people and we've got some delays in getting our receivables. And so the loans have to go up because we have people we're paying and we have people who aren't paying us in, as many, in, in a very short period of time. And so now we have financing to subsidize that. And that's often a picture of growth in business is that all of these commitments are there. And if the contractual, if, if, if in the contracting of revenues, you haven't, the business owner has not contracted the revenues to be collected soon enough, you would end up with this increasing debt. Um, I think that's it on that. So when we graph things, we start to see patterns. And this is this is why I do encourage all business owners to graph their balance sheet accounts and their uh, income statement accounts in meaningful categories um, year over year or month over month so that they can see these trends. So when we take a look at these two companies, Firm D, has this accounts receivable that was budgeted to be 80,000 and just a flat 80,000. And what we see is in January, it starts just a bit above 80,000. It goes up to maybe 85,000, sits there for a couple months, and then it goes up to about 90,000. And by July, it looks like it's about 95,000. Um, this is not a picture of health um, unless sales have been increasing in the same proportion. So we are seeing a, a percentage growth of, I'm going, I'm going to just do quick math and say maybe 12% over seven months. Well, we'd also want to see revenue growing and by a larger percentage than that. Um, and we would also take a look at days sales in accounts receivable. Um, so what that means is if, let me illustrate by an example. If our sales are, um, say, <clears throat> excuse me, 240,000, that means that we have one third of our sales in um, accounts receivable at 80,000, which means that our day's sales in inventory would be at least three or four months. And um, that's a slow collection period. So in any case, that, that increasing accounts receivable can be a big concern if sales have not increased by at least 12%. We would actually want to see sales increasing more like 50 to 70%, much higher than the increase in accounts receivable because of that day's sales in accounts receivable factor. In the second example, we have a target of 80,000, a budget, right? A budget of 80,000. And our accounts receivable is lower than that in January, then it goes up in February, but it's not much up from the budget. Then it hits about target on in March and it's a little bit lower in April. And then in May, whew, we have a big spike in May, um, but that's resolved by the time we get to June, and the accounts receivable has gone down. That is a much healthier picture. Um, the fluctuations, uh, we don't want to see you know, big, huge fluctuation, and that wouldn't be real big fluctuation. But again, it depends on whether the sales of the company are 240,000 or 2.4 million. It gives you an idea of how the graphical analysis can, just at a snapshot, give you some idea of the picture. Um, Again, I will say this, looking at accounts receivable in isolation without the sales graph right next to it uh, could be misleading. So we always want to just compare it. We want to compare a whole bunch of different ratios and not just focus on one in isolation because there's a lot of interrelationships between all of the other uh, accounts as well. 
Okay, so what do banks look for? So we have banks, we have credit unions, and we have other lenders, mezzanine financers. There's you know lots of lots of options out there, especially when we get into the real estate and development area. There's um, all kinds of uh, financing options, limited partners, um, you know, just people who have a high net worth and have money to lend to make a business grow. Um, all of these lenders, they are giving you money for a certain time and under certain conditions. They'll generally be hands off. Maybe you just provide them with a set of financial statements once a year, maybe quarterly. Uh, some of the franchisees that I've dealt with have a requirement to send in monthly financials. Um, these are not audited. They're not reviewed. They're not, they're not even the year-end compilation statements. It's just something that comes straight from management to the bank. They might want them monthly. It depends on how much financing and how leveraged the company is. Uh, they might have a meeting with you. A, a lot of them, when you are, when the loans are under a million dollars, they just want to have you know, financial statements, regular reports, and some, and with the reporting, some verbiage as to how the business is doing, and, you know, explanation why there's been fluctuations in certain accounts, and they may or may not have a meeting, um, but once you're over a million, they for sure want to have meetings with you, and, and take, you know, might even be quarterly, and have a discussion about how the business is going. Um, I, just a comment and maybe even a plug for the BDC, for the Business Development uh, uh, Corporation. They have a business coaching program where business owners can um, pay uh, they pay by module. There's like three or four different modules that they have. It's $2,500 each. And they will have a lot more meetings with you. You're, you're paying for that service along with the lending. Uh, but this is a really good option. I saw several people who are in startup or under two years. And if you are looking for any financing to grow your organization, that coaching program is fantastic. I had a, a lovely patisserie uh, do super well uh, under that program. They bought two of the modules. One was on marketing and one was on financial interpretation, financial results. And um, uh, they they hit every target and then exceeded it all. And I can talk about it because they sold they sold out um, their business and moved to France after operating it for eight years. And I I, I do attribute a lot of their success uh, partly to their initiative, but largely because they got some really good coaching from BDC, supported by myself as well. I am so thrilled to hear that because I spent four years as a small business advisor with the BDC from 2016 to 2020. And uh, my team across Canada helped develop all of those programs. And we and BDC has all different levels of small business advisory. So if you're receiving lending from the BDC, part of your lending package actually can have the advisory pieces built in. So some of those modules are, you know, $7,500 or $10,000 and that sort of thing to get external consultants to help you for, you know, three month period of time or however long you need it. And they will work with you on everything from HR to marketing to leadership. They have leadership modules, they have financial modules, they have all sorts of things. So I'm so excited, Vanessa, to hear the success of that because we used to run, uh, when I was with BDC, I would manage about 60 of those projects across the prairies with those external consultants from uh, Manitoba all the way even through to BC and uh, great success with those. And they can actually build in those advisory programs with your lending. So part of your lending package is applied to pay for those as well. So while you're talking, Vanessa, I will insert some of those links from the BDC for that. I, I greatly appreciate that because I, I stay in contact with a couple of people from BDC and um, and I, I, I refer some people to the program and particularly the one advisor she she's sort of the supervisory uh, role who then connects the other advisors and it, it, to be part of the, the the BDC ends up actually partnering with the business owner in making that successful and I think the key takeaways from my business owner um, in in that really great example is that um, they knew exactly how many pastries they needed to sell in order to cover their costs then they also had a target for what they wanted, you know, what they needed to sell to pay themselves enough. And then they had sort of this bonus 
amount and they in, at, at all times they never exceeded 75% of their capacity, meaning that if a big order came in, they still had uh, capacity, ability to make more and they weren't burning themselves out. And they knew all of those numbers uh, you know, very early on and uh, that's what a lot of my business owners just, you know, they're really good at doing what they do and have a harder time knowing how to make those numbers work. And it was, it was a really big takeaway. The, 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 the ratios and everything that I'm giving you here today are, um, you know, they're, they're very global and, and you, you only get there by understanding all the nitty gritty from your business. And if I go back to that patisserie example, these people knew exactly um, how much uh, it cost in the inputs for each and every pastry and what it took from a labor perspective to make each one of those. And then they just multiplied that out to, to get there. And, and yes, there was some efficiencies in making bigger batches, but when they started with the minutia, they always knew that the batches were just gonna get them that much more um, net profit. And su super, super amazing to work with them because, um, uh, and, and and I have some other examples like that, but I'm just focusing on that one because um, just to, just to stick to one. Um, okay, so now you, some of you have noted in the chats that you do have some investment, uh, you know, investment from a variety of sources, founder funds. Meaning that you're dealing with these investors, these people that are more your business partner than an investor. These are these are people who have bought shares of the company, not just debt, or they may have given you debt, and uh, and and then um, put some conditions that if the debt falls between this, they become an equity partner. There can be all kinds of that. Anybody who um, you know, watches Dragon's Den, for example, you see how they, the, 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 those, how, how these investors will partner in a business and they will uh, take back equity and some level of control so that they're, they have some uh, level of control over their investment and will help the business owner um, overcome challenges. That said, they may have a viewpoint that is not aligned with your viewpoint and you need to hash that out before they become an investor because you could get into a situation where you might have to buy them out because they are trying to take the business in a way and a direction um, that you didn't want to have happen and that you don't think is good for the business on, on, on a go forward basis. So they are your partner. That's a really great thing. They're focused in participating in the future success of the business. So they're really focused on that. That's a real positive. They can add expertise and contacts. And I like the Dragon's Den um, example because the, that's usually what um, these business owners end up getting is all of the contacts, the, the media exposure, um, all of the social media um, promos, et cetera. But the downside is they can be intrusive and... Um, if performance targets don't get hit, there can be some really painful provisions for the business owner, um, even a full buyout of your business. And you know, now you have to go find a different job. So they're, they're just, just to always understand what it is that you are contracting, always involve a lawyer in the drafting of those, um, just those documents. Um, the lawyer is not there to just provide you a document to sign. Uh, the lawyer is there to provide you the discussion points and all of the pitfalls because that's the benefit of a lot of these lawyers is that they've seen all kinds of problems arise. And so they can talk you through all of the points ahead of time so that they make sure that everybody's on the same page and that they understand that they're agreeing to the same outcomes and results and have explored what happens if we don't make the target you know, do, do we have to, do we have an obligatory, you know, buy you back, buy, buy back your shares, et cetera. So. So now how do you cure an unhealthy balance sheet? This is probably where I've spent a big chunk of my career. Um, the first thing, so, 
you know, in that graphical analysis, we see that accounts receivable growing. And if sales were stable, that's a real problem, okay? Um, if sales have been increasing, we don't know that that's a problem. We just have to take a look at a whole bunch of other ratios to see if it's a problem. But if accounts receivable are increasing and yet sales have remained stable compared to the prior year, this is a problem. Your customers aren't paying you and you have a risk that maybe you don't get paid for the work that you've that the company has done. So we need to understand what's going on. Um, we need to do some digging, maybe make some phone calls to those customers find out what's causing the delay in their payment. Is this an industry-wide thing? Is this, um, they didn't uh, appreciate the service and that they have some problems with the, the service delivery and that maybe there's some unresolved um, problems in, 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 in there. Um, so we need, we need to know, and then we start to resolve those. Um, so in the case of it's an industry-wide thing, well, now we're gonna do more credit checks. Now we're not going to extend as much credit to um, our customers. We're going to require them to pay us twice a month instead of once a month or, you know, pay us every 15 days or 30 days instead of every 30 and 60 days. Um, or we won't do deliveries. You, you, you put in some consequences. It, it, I wouldn't call them consequences. You put in some good measured uh, business proactivity. Um, it is really important to get those underlying problems diagnosed correctly, uh, not to make assumptions, go out and discuss things with um, whoever it is that you need to. Um, if it's internal to the company, maybe go, if you, you know, let's say you're a manufacturing company, go to the shop floor and figure out what's going on. Um, if you are an installation company, go out onto the job sites and see how people are working and see, you know, the end results and see the process there determine if some changes need to be made to make things more efficient or get um, the finishing correct on something so that a customer has no problem paying you, that type of thing. Um, when you look and define the causes, now you need to develop a, an action plan. So this is where maybe a Gantt chart, you get a Gantt chart out. And anybody who doesn't know what a Gantt chart is, what it, it's a basically a timeline with a whole bunch of action points that are along the way and different people be responsible for implementing different process changes, uh, different improvements, that kind of thing along the way, and have regular check-in and meetings. And know that the finances are only the result of doing a good job elsewise. It, it, um, it, and so doing the good work and pricing it well um, is what makes the finance machine work. And so it's usually all of these underlying process issues that you have to work on. This fits into a strategic plan of the company. Um, it, it fits into understanding how all of the pieces and components are working together. And I, I, I see some people here, for example, have some weather dependent um, industries with farming and, and, and that kind of thing. And um, it's also seasonal. Uh, I remember working with the golf courses that I worked with, all of their loans, they paid principal and interest payments only in the six months they were operating. That's the way they negotiated their financing. Over the winter, if they had the funds, they would pay the interest. If not, they didn't have an obligation to even pay the interest. So they, they, they always, um, they, they still made the same payments over the year as they would if it was an annual financing contract, but they had been smart about it right up front, we're only gonna pay you while we have cash coming in the door and we'll just pay you double in those months, what we would elsewise. You see, so you can do some creative financing strategies that way. Um, when we deal with the seasonal component, you wanna make sure you have your proper crop insurance that you're dealing with any uh, grants that you know all of the government grants available to make sure that you can keep that financing coming in the door. Um, just looking to see if there's any other examples I can. Um, and I, yeah, so I think there's a few other examples, but I think that we have covered, I've covered sort of the, the main sort of creative ideas on how to redo your financing or change your financing for that. One of, the, um, 
One of the things that I do for accounts receivable in my business is we give people a discount for early payment. So you can, <laughs> we call it baiting them with honey. <laughs> so <laughs> if rather than being punishing at the end and saying, we're going to charge you interest on, on, you know, past due accounts, we, we sort of bait them with honey at the front end and say, Hey, if you pay early, we'll give you, you know, a percentage off your, your bill. Uh, another way we we learned quickly in my business to to do that is accepting EFT, uh, having lots of different ways to accept payment and encouraging payment in multiple ways uh, was another way we did it. Uh, focusing on immediate payment uh, activities from clients that we could immediately generate cash from was another way we did it. So, so lots and lots of great resources to figure those pieces of it out for sure. I know in my own business, one of the things that would happen is that, you know, it, it, the year end business, so not, not my, not my fractional side, but the year end business is that there was two dynamics that would happen. Number one, uh, because it was an annual fee, people would um, not talk to me about transactions throughout the year. They thought that I was going to charge them with every phone call, which, which wasn't, if they actually did it, that wouldn't be their experience. It, and so I would get to the end and they would have made some decisions throughout the year that I could have easily had a two minute or five minute conversation with them in the year and said, yeah, you, you don't want to buy that equipment in the business because that's really personal equipment or, it, or you don't want to buy that in your holding company because now we've got to do fair market rent over and I, I just don't see any benefit to that. It's actually better in the business. Um, there's potential losses that couldn't be used by the operating company if they put it in the wrong entity. They would make all of these bad entity decisions all by themselves. And at the end of the year, just expect me to fix it. And the fix was expected to be a journal entry, but that's not legally correct. I, th th we need everything in the proper legal name. And to unwind it now would cost a whole bunch of legal costs on top of mine and refinancing costs because they have to move the financing into a different entity. And um, I, when I asked them, you know, why didn't you just give me a call? It would have taken me two to five minutes to advise you on that. It, it was going to cost me too much. So my resolution to that was to do a monthly billing. And that gives people, so it's the same fee over the year. And it actually costs the client way less because otherwise I come to the end of the year and I have, uh, I'm sorry, like you made these bad decisions. Um it, 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 you know, just because you you didn't know, I get that you didn't know, but I was available to make you know. So let's, and now I've got to charge you an extra thousand or two thousand dollars to unwind those transactions. So instead, same fee over the year, you have free access to me. You know, up to three hours a month. Give me a phone call, and I will happily um, help you through those types of things. So, um, and it also improved the cash flow because now I don't have these big swings when the you know, December year ends come around or um, that kind of thing. Uh, so there's there's lots of creative ways to deal with cash flow and um, how you bill your clients, how you do your pricing. Um, and I, I like your honey idea because you always win way more flies with honey than you will um, with vinegar. So. Um, so I, I, I am at the end of the presentation part. Um, there, in the documents that you have, there's a glossary, glossary of terms. Um, there's an implementation checklist. I'm just going to pop that onto the screen. And so, you know, actually do these calculations. How is your business doing with the quick ratio, the debt to equity ratio? Um, do calculate your growth rates for major balance sheet categories, not just your income statement. Um, and understand the relationship. My revenue grew by 50%, my accounts receivable by 12%. That's a pretty good ratio. But if my revenue grew by 10% and my accounts receivable by 50%, we have a problem. Um, and so analyze the trends for problem areas to identify problem areas at the financial level, which will then trigger you to take a look at the operating side of things and see what, what needs to be corrected at the operations level. And uh, um, make sure that, you know, make a list of questions for your accountant. Um, if, you, if you're not understanding your numbers and you don't know if it's a good or bad thing, some Googling might help, but also co contact your accountant. Um, it, it's an accountant that can do a bit more than just a tax return. 
somebody who can do some advising for you. And there's lots of us out there. So that's a big one. When we advise people about how to look for accountants, uh, we always recommend uh, that they look for an accountant who's willing to work with them and build strategy with them and forward planning, not just someone who's going to do year end work and, and that's it. Uh, you know, any bookkeeper can help you with those sorts of things, but your accountant is trained as an advisor who can do so much more. So it's not always about, you know, what is the least expensive accounting service? It's all about what is the most beneficial to my business? accounting service and how can I leverage that advisor for my business? We have a great comment here from Rosemary. I've had experience with discounting. They would take the discount, <laughs> date the check, and then mail it 30 days later. Why <laughs> am I not surprised, Rosemary, that we've got a story like that? Um, that is the benefit of having electronic funds transfers, PayPal, and digital sorts of banking in modern times is that if they want to take advantage of it, have them sign up for electronic funds transfers with you and it has to arrive the day of and then you can avoid that kind of issue because believe me I've had those experiences too oh the check is in the mail uh, in modern times we no longer need to get that excuse from any of our clients about checks in the mail uh, for sure I have left for folks the page to the BDC website all about the advisory services as well in the chat. I have put the financial tools from BDC because I know that Vanessa has left a checklist of ratios here. Uh, I've put the ratio page from BDC so that you have the calculators for all of those things. And I'll do it again. It's in the uh, chat for everyone. Those are the ratio calculators uh, from BDC as well. And it sounds, Vanessa, like your uh, client had the financial advisory services probably delivered by a CPA consultant who helped them build out a financial dashboard uh, for the business. The dashboarding in the financial uh, consulting with BDC is second to none. They'll help you build a dashboard for your business. It's amazing. And yeah. I, I, and I, I don't know that they actually built a dashboard like this. This is going back a few years um, before we sort of in the last what, eight years, we've seen an explosion in the software uh, that just does dashboarding and you you pick and yeah. choose what you're going to put in it. The, they um, uh, they just got to know exactly what numbers they needed to hit and and they dashboarded it in, in Excel. It was pretty yeah. low tech but a high quality piece of information for them to know. Yeah, it totally works. And when you get those services, it's to teach the business owner how to do things. So when you're working with the advisory from BDC, if you're working with the small business advisory services, which is what most of you would work with, it would be about teaching the business owner. So you, the business owner, are engaged in the process of what do I need to know in my business and how does that work and what's the language and uh, it's really good services to get. Reminder to everyone that services like that are usually for companies who are at least two years old or older. So the BDC, for those of you not familiar with it, is the Business Development Bank of Canada, taxpayer funded crown corporation. They like to say they're the only crown corporation that makes money for taxpayers because of course they lend and get interest on lending. So uh, they like to brag about that a little bit, but that's the bank for entrepreneurs in this country. Most, uh, most G8 nations have uh, this type of bank for their entrepreneurs across the globe. This is a business development bank, which means you're going there when you're probably two years or older because you have some history and you have some financials and they can lend to you based on that. Uh, but do check out all the free articles, resources, tools that you can even take free small business courses through them as well uh, to supplement this type of work that you're getting with Vanessa today as well. Um, let's open it up to questions. So anyone have questions in Q&A or burning, pressing uh, things they want answered? Let's go back to chat. Yeah, farming is very weather dependent. It's dependent on a lot of things. I grew up on a dairy farm, so farming is blah. Yeah, dependent on a lot of stuff. So uh, Community Futures has lending programs as well if you're in the farming 
business, the uh, Farm Credit of Canada, a number of those types of organizations are, are there to assist you with the financing pieces of things. So if you're, uh, you know, purchasing machinery for distillery, that sort of thing, maybe it's better to lease that stuff. Maybe it's better, you know, there's lots of questions to answer there for sure. I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, there's people who said that they're with media production and HR consulting, uh, which are very uh, they're professional services industries like my own. And some of the key numbers to always keep an eye on are your recovery rates. Um, so if you're doing fixed fee billing uh, to always keep track of people's hours and figure out what your actual recovery rate is. So fee divided by hours on each project. Um, you do need a project-based um, timekeeping system and uh, revenue system that are tied together. And there's lots of good apps for that. They've, they've existed for you know, 15, 20 years for sure. Um, it, and media production for broadcast and tourism. So you know, there'll be a lot of you know, graphic designers or video editors and all of those types of pieces going into it and understanding what takes the time what needs the expertise and what rates are market rates. I can just, I'm just thinking off the top of my head on some of those things. And, and just an added, you know, bit of information too, is that the public library has researchers that have access to a database of business information, business databases that otherwise would cost a business owner six to $10,000 just to acquire the right to get that, that access. And you can ask them, they, they charge $80 an hour, you can ask them to do certain research for you, either in the marketing side or salary grid side. Um, these are some inexpensive ways to get a hold of some valuable data as a business owner, if you're kind of wondering if you're, if, if you're on target. And also Business Link has the exact same thing. We have all of those databases as well and a market research department. And the fellow who manages our market research department has been doing it for 25 years since Business Link has been around. We do that for free. So if okay. you're not getting what you're getting from the library, you can reach out to, we actually give uh, presentations, uh, webinars, and all of that sort of thing on market research, because that's one of the core pieces of business. So we have the same, we have the Hoover's database, we have a Statista, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for organizations to have access to that. And I will pop that into the chat. So you can get it from us, you can get it from the library. If you receive lending from BDC, they also include bits and pieces of that sort of thing as well. Uh, but I'm going to just pop the market research in because we will do that as well. We will look up all the data and statistics for you. And coming in June, we have Stats Can giving us another uh, presentation on how to find tons of stuff on the Stats Can website. So the folks from Statistics Canada give that presentation uh, three or four times a year for Business Link. So if you want to check out when the next market research pieces are happening, I'll put that in the chat as well. So that's a great tool as well, Vanessa, the uh, reminding people that they can get also financial ratios that are industry standards for their yep. business through market research. You know, knowing how you compare to others in your industry uh, is uh, really uh, important. And some of those companies, yeah, some, some of those companies get data. Like I, I know in the real estate sector and also in the hotel sector, there's a whole bunch of privately held uh, organizations that will provide data to, the, to them. Um, so it's not just the public companies. It's pretty important because private companies just have quite a bit of um, quite a few differences. Number one, a lower tax rate. Number two, uh, a different uh, a different strata of the uh, the staffing on the staffing side. So, yes. Yeah. Okay, a reminder to everyone as well that you're getting the PDF of the slides. Uh, that was in the link put in the chat box earlier. I'll do a follow-up email to everyone as well with that link. The recording for this webinar will go up in the next two days onto the Business Link website and past presentations, including a past one from uh, Vanessa 
is also currently on the website. So I'm going to put that link into chat for everyone. So if you want to see this recorded webinar in a few days, it's going to be at this link that I just put into chat. And the previous CPA presentations are already in there. You can go and see the previous five uh, from our session. Uh, and do you want to put some of your contact information and that sort of thing back on the screen, Vanessa? Well, I ask people to uh, maybe complete a survey. So I'm going to put a survey link, an evaluation survey link into the uh, chat box as well. And you're also going to, uh, oh, I don't have it ready. So I'll send it to you via email. So when I follow up with everyone who's attended today via email, please take time to complete the evaluation survey at the end as well. It helps, uh, it helps CPA Canada and it helps us understand if we're giving you the information you need, if it's relevant, if you're finding it useful and helpful. So it's gonna really help us continue to build these uh, programs out. Uh, yeah, and I've just, I, um, I've just put, sorry, this is uh, there. This is, this is my professional corp. Um, so www.vabrown.ca. And this is my other business, the fractional controllership and, and CFO business side of things. And this is the one that would work uh, alongside a, um, a the, the BDC or, or just after the BDC one is done, this is where this one could step in and, and help um, with those monthly financials. So yeah, no, and I thank you so much, Linda, for all your extra insights and the information about Business Link. I, I am not familiar with Business Link, and I just am grateful to you to sh for sharing that. Great. Okay, thank you. We really appreciate you taking the time today. I'm going to stop the recording, everyone. So Thank you for joining us today. I hope everyone has a wonderful lunch. I'll do a follow-up email. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again next week, Vanessa, for the next presentation. Yeah. And on that note, uh, wishing everyone a wonderful afternoon and thanks for staying on board today and participating. We really appreciate it. Take care.